Well, good morning, everyone. This is Penny at Wisconsin Land and Water, and I am the Conservation Training and Membership Services Manager at Wisconsin Land and Water. And today, for our presentation, we have Michael Shea and Steve Becker from NRCS. Otherwise, I think we're ready to turn it over to Steve. Yeah. Thanks, Penny. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Steve Becker. I'm the NRCS State Conservationist. Uh, engineer out of Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and I'm up in Spooner uh, today with Michael Shea. He's our state design engineer. And uh, Michael Shea is retiring uh, next Friday after 21 years of federal service. And um, it almost makes me get teary eyed even saying it. Uh, Mike's um, had such an impact and added a tremendous amount of value to uh, conservation engineering in, in Wisconsin, and we're really going to miss him. Not only uh, are we losing um, a very competent design engineer in the design of reinforced concrete structures, uh, but Mike also had the added bonus of having a master's degree in geotechnical engineering, which is, uh, you know, extremely valuable to the agency. So. Anyways, um, I'm up in Spooner today, basically um, helping Mike with file transfers and moving some equipment and stuff down to Madison. So anyways, um, I wanna welcome you to this NRCS webinar entitled Geotechnical Investigations for Farm Said Structures. And I'm going to um, uh, turn off the video just to ensure that I got maximum bandwidth. Um, and hopefully we'll get through this without any major interruptions um, in the transmission. So the purpose of this webinar is to explain our technical recommendations for foundation investigations recently published in the Engineering Field Handbook, Chapter 4, Exhibit A. It provides guidelines for NRCS investigation, and it est establishes the basic expectations for a functional review of consultant designs. The need for Exhibit A in this webinar arises from our increasing concern about the environmental consequences of seepage from waste storage tanks, tanks that can be compromised by shear failure or settlement in the foundation. And along the way, we took a, a little harder look at the stability of retaining walls for waste and feed storage and vertical and lateral, lateral support for post and pier foundations for roof structures. You know, some folks are looking at, you know, the issue of separation to bedrock and water tables and not really examining the potential for bearing failure or settlement. And so, um, Exhibit A. Um, bring some focus to those issues and provide some guidelines. I think increasingly the siting of these structures has become larger, as large as our spanning um, variations in the soil and the structures are perched into hillsides with substantial amounts of earth fill support. This webinar is not intended to be a comprehensive foundation design course in two hours. I want to be clear about that, but rather it's, it's a discourse about my concerns as a state conservation engineer and the standard of care for the investment of federal funds in these farm said structures. So my interest in competent foundations started back in Minnesota I was an engineer in Minnesota for about 15 years, and then I went out to Montana as a state engineer. And I was out there for about 12 years. Um, my interest in competent foundations started back in Minnesota, where a tank was installed on lean clays, you know, with little to no soils investigation. And as with, you know, manufactured buildings, you know, the tank retailer had a statement in the plan set that said the foundation was the responsibility of the owner or the owner's designated representative. And the owner thought 
the installation crew was responsible for proofing the foundation and so you know the fine print kind of had set up a situation where a good foundation investigation was never really done to make a long story short the tank settled and ruptured the loading conduit and the static head in the tank discharged into the soil through you know though the discharge worked its way along the frost line to an open ditch and then the tank discharged into a lake before we uh get into the technical recommendations in exhibit a which is largely a just a narrative exercise of looking at what's written i guess um i want to illustrate some of my concerns about bearing capacity and settlement of these shallow foundations you know shallow foundations are you know by definition foundations where the footing depth is less than the footing width Many of you folks have probably seen this illustration um, or something similar. Concentrated loads at, at the ground surface increase the vertical stress in the soil to a depth much greater than most people realize. And it's this pressure distribution that drives the prescriptive, the prescriptive depth for foundation investigations. And typically that investigation depth is in the range of 20 to 30 feet below the tank. So as you can see on the, the figure on the left, the Y axis reports the increase in vertical stress, delta P divided by the load, Q. And you can see how the additional pressure diminishes with depth where B You know, at first glance, you would need to investigate to a depth of about two times the tank width to evaluate soil experiencing at least 10% of the load, or 0.1, or delta P over Q is 0.1. And you would say, well, Steve, these tanks are 200 feet wide, and we're not, we're not going to investigate down to 400 feet. Um, but I think the closer reality is that a portion of the tank is most likely to experience a local shear failure, and that's you know along the wall footing. And so on the right, the illustration on the right kind of shows a typical tank wall footing, which is only around four feet. And the connection, so if there is a shear failure, you know, I think it a localized shear failure would most likely occur uh, along the wall or near that footing. Um, and the connection between the wall footing and the tank slab is pretty much inconsequential. So if we're investigating down 20 to 30 feet um, and the footing is four feet, you know, we're, we're down there to around four to five times uh, the foundation width. And I think we should be good. Uh, we should be concerned about bearing capacity failures, even if applying you know, less than 2,000 pounds per square foot of pressure on the soil. This slide basically illustrates the three basic modes of shear failure. Um, and you'll notice that I'm kind of showing the tank wall footing and not necessarily the, the full tank slab. The slab foundation, the slab um, or the tank slab has foundation vulnerability, no doubt, uh, but I think it's mostly related to settlement. Unless the tank is sitting on a substantial amount of fill. And then we'll talk about that a little later. So the basic failure mechanisms is pretty common knowledge. Um, is the general field shear failure, a local shear shear failure, and a punching. Uh, 
you know, although we, you know, we certainly don't expect a general shear failure that ruptures the surface or a punching shear failure, unless you basically poured the tank in a pocket of mud. Um, the wall footing most likely would experience a localized shear failure in soft clays, which you know might appear as you know dramatic settlement. I was looking hard for <clears throat> some localized shear failure photos and some photos of problems with tanks, and um, you know it was difficult. So these photos. These illustrations or photos here just is trying to demonstrate a point or a distinction between those failure modes. So, you know, like as I mentioned, um, you know, for after these tanks are poured and these walls are anywhere from say 12 to 20 feet high, you know, immediately after construction, the wall footings are going to be loaded to two to three thousand pounds per square foot and the slab it's going to take you know almost a full year to fill that tank with liquid and so there is um if a shear failure occurs i i you know i strongly kind of feel it's going to occur right off of that footing and that if settlement issues occur you know that's going to uh, reveal itself as more of a crack across the slab on grade. So, um, this slide here, um, you know, most people move pretty quickly to these presumptive allowable bearing capacity values that are published in the IBC and we have this particular table in conservation practice standard 313 for waste storage structures you know that presumptive bearing capacity values are based you know only on a visual classification of soils um, but the values are not necessarily a true representation of the actual capacity or the real or reliability and they don't really consider important factors that affect bearing capacity such as the shape and width of the depth of the footing the inclination of the footing location of the water table um, and they don't consider the void ratios of the soil uh, which has the direct effect on elastic settlement and consolidation of the soil so in a lot of re in a lot of ways, um, these presumptive values are intended for preliminary design or the design of small, unimportant structures, and they're not necessarily um, conservative. And I guess my feeling is, particularly some of these large tanks that are storing three to six million gallons of waste, these are not small, unimportant structures. So these are the factors that actually drive the presumptive bearing capacity values in the IBC. So let's just kind of examine those. This is that Meyerhoff equation. Um, it's expressed in almost all the foundation engineering um, references. And it's a combination of factors. Um, including the first set of factors um, looking at shear strength of the soil and the second set of factors looking at uh, the tank surcharge the third set of factors They're looking at, uh, oh my goodness, Mike, help me out. That third set of factors that's looking at. Yeah. Oh, but basically, the 
the Meyerhoff equation is taking into consideration the undrained soil cohesion or the shear strength in the clay, the unit weight of the soil. If there's any surcharge above the foundation bottom, the width of the diameter um, of the foundation. And then there's a bunch of you know, non-dimensional shape factors as a function of soil friction. Um, the equation pretty simplifies pretty quickly um, for the worst case condition. So if the tank is set on the soil surface and there is no surcharge above the footing around the perimeter of the tank, that second set of factors goes to zero. And if you are on saturated clays um, under the phi equals zero condition, the third set of factors disappear. So this bearing ultimate bearing capacity formula simplifies down to a pretty uh, simplifies down to basically getting the undrained soil cohesion or shear strength in the clay. So the allowable bearing capacity of the soil would be 6.14 times the undrained soil cohesion divided by a factor of safety, which is typically three for foundation work. So if you're looking at a you know a tank that's putting on putting 2,000 pounds per square foot on the soil, you know you can target or look for a threshold value for undrained soil cohesion of around 1,000 psf. So if you're evaluating a test pit, you can proof the soil profile for that minimum value for shear strength or undrained cohesion. And this is kind of where the field tools come in handy. And for most of our tanks, and are looking for an undrained co uh, cohesion of at least a thousand psf. So there are several ways uh, to get at the shear strength of the soil, and hopefully they corroborate each other. Um, the easiest probably is these pocket tools that can be used in the field to kind of proof the weakest cohesive layer in the soil profile. So one of those tools is the is a tor vein where you press these veins into the soil and you you apply a torque and eventually the the soil fails along those veins and you get a reading and uh, the shape and depth of the veins um, are calibrated to that reading. And the reading is actually the undrained um, cohesion of the soil. And so we're looking for a reading of about 0.5 tons per square foot or 1,000 pounds per square foot. And if you get that, you can put that directly into the bearing capacity equation with a factor safety of three, and you see you come up with 2,000 PSF. Different tools uh, are helpful in different situations, particularly if there's a lot of pebbles and coarse fragments in the soil. Sometimes it's a little easier to find a small pocket and use a pocket penetrometer. And that gives you the unconfined compressive strength of the soil, not So that reading um, is still in tons per square foot. But if you kind of remember more circle, you basically have to divide that value by two. So that's why we're looking at a pocket penetrometer reading of one ton per square foot or 2000 pounds per square foot um, in order to get um, a shear strength of 1000 PSF to give us 2,000 pounds per square foot of allowable bearing. So in exhibit A, 
basically kind of call out a Torvein reading of around 0.5 tons per square foot or a pocket penetrometer reading of around one ton per square foot. And you can kind of see why we're making that call. So if you have a really high tank wall and you might be putting on closer to 3000 PSF, or if you have a really tall tank wall that's sitting on some earth fill that adds additional load uh, to that soil, uh, the original soil uh, foundation, you might be looking at um, a little higher readings. You might go out there and probe for a little higher threshold. And I think it's tool is, is to kind of know what the minimum that you're looking for and just look for any uh, portions of the soil stratigraphy that might um, be weaker than what you need. There are other ways um, to get soil, soil shear strength, of course. Um, just the normal operation of logging soils, you can use a thumb penetration test for consistency. That's one way. I'm not sure how reliable it is. Um, you almost have to kind of calibrate yourself and do it fairly often. Um, but you can and shear strength um, in saturated clays in particular. And you can see that correlation in this chart. You can also get it from liquidity index, you know, which is just using some of the index properties of the soil or the engineering properties of the soil. The calculation for liquidity index is in the footnote and below counts. <clears throat> so all of this has a cost, right? So SPT drilling. Uh, Mike O'Shea did a yesterday uh, contacted a, a couple of geotechnical firms and grabbed some prices for us just to give put some of this discussion into context. Um, so using the split spoon samplers and SP or blow counts, um, you can get shear strength from that. There's some typical costs. Um, if the tor vein or the pocket penetrometer, you know, if you can't get that to work well or it's inconclusive or you're sitting right around um, an undrained cohesion of, you know, of 0.5 or less and it, it, you're, you're just uncertain, you can pull an undisturbed sample. That's probably the next cheapest route and do an unconfined compressive compressive strength test in the lab. And that apparatus is shown there in the photo on the left. The other route, um, it's a little, you know, less conservative because most of these soils do have um, some cohesive strength and they have some uh, frictional strength to them is you can do a triaxial shear test, right? So that apparatus is on the right, but those tests are pretty expensive. Um, you can see it's around a, a hundred and fifty dollars a point. And if you kind of remember the whole more circle thing, you know, you want at least three circles, right? So you'll need three points to get a good line um, to develop that shear strength equation plus oh yeah i'm gotta be careful it's been a long <laughs> day trying to cram in all the preparation of this powerpoint so i'll just kind of stop there i think so um, another way, you know, this is a, um, here's a typical uh, 
drilling log. Um, the next least expensive route if you get the, a drill rig out there. Um, the total estimated cost for collecting this level of information we're estimating here at about $1,500 per boring. And you can see uh, the data that would be collected in this, this boring. Um, the column that says N, that's your blow counts on your split spoon sampler. Um, there is a sample type there. It says SS for split spoon. TW is for your thin walled Shelby tube sampling. Um, and uh, the recovered sample length in inches, that's the R-E-C-I-N. And the reason I'm delaying here a little bit is half of a third of my slides is covered up by the people who are attending the meetings and the go-to meeting. <laughs> I don't know how to get rid of that. Um, Can you just so, X out of it? You know, as soon as I click the X, it says, do you want to leave the meeting? Oh. Can, so I'm trying to figure out how to get more. Or move it to the other screen. <laughs> so if anybody has any ideas. So. Um, Let me grab. Can you pull off on it yep. to minimize it? What's that? Can you like grab on it and minimize it? There's a, like the double yeah. arrow or does that do your whole screen? Yeah, I can't grab a double arrow. Foiled a little bit here. So anyways, I'm, I do have a sheet on the side here so maybe I can get through this. Um, where a sample was pulled, we were getting the moisture content and the undisturbed density of that sample. And then you can see there's a value of 1360. Um, that's the unconfined compression test that was run at the lab. And then you'll see a, a column with a little QP, and that would be your pocket penetrometer. So basically, while they were out there drilling, they were running the pocket penetrometer to get kind of a relative density. A relative um, compressive strength of the soil and then when they did a lab test on their sample then they were able to correlate that to the various layers in that log so anyways um, there's several ways to get that shear stress strength value and um, couple of different approaches to testing for it if, 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 if it comes to that. So I wanted to move just a little bit into a discussion on total and differential settlement um, and then kind of dive into that narrative a little bit in exhibit A. So like I said I think you know settlement on these tanks my primary concern is the integrity of the slabs on grade you know those are these rigid slabs are vulnerable to subgrade bearing and when you lose that you know you're going to end up with tank with cracks and these structures are pretty expensive the environmental consequences are can be pretty substantial over time um, and so I am concerned about settlement. I tried to grab some graphics um, and demonstrate the point. These are these floor slabs are not structural slabs. They're not like a slab in a parking air, parking uh, ramp, for example. I mean, they're totally dependent upon the integrity of the subgrade for support. And when you lose that, they don't have a lot of tensile strength. So when you talk about settlement, it's 
the allowable settlement quickly comes into the um, into the conversation. So if you're worried about settlement, the big question in the room is, well, what's allowable? So Mike and I were wrestling a little bit this morning trying to find the reference for this uh, these maximum allowable settlement values for structures used in resource management systems. We'll come up with them. I've seen this a couple of times, but for the life of me and preparing this presentation and the time I had, I couldn't come up with the reference. But I did have enough time yesterday to, you know, do dig a little bit and see how it would correlate to maybe, uh, you know, the recommendations in the industry in and around uh, building construction which is where allowable settlement is expressed in terms of angular distortion, um, which is, you know, the differential change divided by the length of the foundation. Or the, so two and a half inches in a hundred feet um, seems to be, um, It seems to be the safe limit. Um, where you know where cracking is not permissible in the building industry, it equates to one a distort angular distortion of one over five hundred, or a foot of a foot of differential settlement in five hundred feet. So this would be two and a half inches over a hundred feet. And in a 200 foot diameter tank, of course, that would be five, five inches. If you, if you drilled for a tank foundation and you knew the entire tank um, would settle uniformly, then the allowable settlement could be doubled to five inches and a hundred feet, but that would be, uh, that would be kind of a stretch to assume that you have that information about the foundation of a large diameter tank, for example. There would be no assurances that that tank would settle that uniformly. So for, the, for all practical purposes, we are concerned about differential settlement um, and two and a half inches and a hundred feet is what we feel to be a reasonable allowable maximum. So settlement can get, um, and the calculations for it can get pretty involved. Um, but nevertheless, I feel like some of this needs to be kind of um, expressed. Um, so I guess it'll suffice to say that total settlement is a combination of elastic settlement that occurs immediately or shortly after construction and primary consolidation, which is you know, the long-term dissipation of pore water pressure and the reorganization of those soil particles um, as the stress is transferred to that soil skeleton. There's a, there's a couple of different phases to the settlement, and I think it's important to be aware of both, um, particularly Folks said after they build the tank, they don't see any problems. And so the problems would never exist, right? And I, I don't, that's not the case. I think that's the point of this slide. That some of this consolidation can go on for several months. Um, and you won't realize the problem until maybe after the tank is full. Um, or everyone has kind of moved on. The other point I wanted to make is if the soil is over consolidated or pre consolidated, like as in the case of you're in an, in an area of the state where there's glacial till, settlement really is not an issue. So, the, kind of the question is how do you know whether these soils are normally consolidated or over consolidated? 
Well, in the case of glacial till, you know, you can consult a geologist or a soil scientist to determine whether you're located in a glacial till unit. And I'm not sure about um, Wisconsin, but I remember in Minnesota going out with the soil scientist and those glacial tills came down from Canada, you know, those uh, soils were pushed in from a lobe that came out of Canada and they were calcareous in nature. And so the soil scientists would check for effervescence or reaction with HCl. Um, that was just kind of one of the methods that he used to verify the fact that our structures were in till. There is some other ways that you can um, estimate over cons consolidation um, with the undrained cohesion, for example. Right here. Huh. Michael Shea, he just showed me how to make, so I can see the rest of my screen. I, I'm like, <laughs> uh, that's very helpful. I, I apologize to everyone out there, but it's really hard when you can only see two thirds of your slide set. <laughs> Anyways, I'll kind of go back. Like I said, um, with regard to settlement, I think a good first move is to decide is to try to come to some decision of whether you're in an over consolidated or pre consolidated soil unit. And you can estimate this over consolidation ratio with undrained shear stress using your pocket penetration, pocket tools, or some of the other methods we just mentioned, and uh, plasticity index, right? just using engineering properties. Uh, Atterberg limits is uh, a pretty cheap uh, lab test. So, so pre-consolidation or effective overburden stress can be estimated um, using the, this equation. I got this from Danny McCook, who was at our uh, soil mechanics lab for many years. It's also in the those Navy, uh, what is the name of that Navy? Yeah, there's, a, there's another reference there related to um, some Navy engineering reference. Um, so I guess the point being is that you can estimate the pre-consolidation pressure with some basic engineering properties um, and make that decision of whether it's pre-consolidated. And then that solves or puts to rest a lot of concern um, and issues with regard to settlement. Um, I have, you know, I took a foundations engineering course and many of you that are listening to this probably have. Uh, Braja Das was a, you know, a big name or professor in that in that science um, and in his book um, he publishes I'm not even sure if this isn't a close derivation or what I just showed you but you can calculate uh, the over consolidation ratio basically to what level um, was the soil pre-consolidated to above the load that you're applying. And so once again, it's just um, a relationship between the um, pre using the factors of plasticity index and undrained cohesion. So there is a couple of different ways of knowing whether you're in a pre-consolidated unit, and I think it's worthwhile to uh, to make that determination. Um, I had a, previously I brought up that soil log showing the split soon blow counts, um, an unconfined compression test, um, um, where an undisturbed sample was used to do an unconfined compression test and get a dry density. That was enough information for, for me to do an estimate of total settlement. Um, 
on a tank that I worked uh, worked on on one of my jobs. And I'm not going to kind of dive into the equation for elastic settlement um, or consolidation, primary consolidation. Um, but I will just mention there is a pretty substantial difference between the settlement in over consolidated clay and the settlement in normal consolidated clay. And I think I'll just kind of leave it at that. As a matter of fact, these are pretty strong. A lot of these over consolidated clays with uh, the tank uh, heisen that we're dealing with, um, I think you can expect um, less than an inch of settlement if the soil has been over consolidated. So, there are ways of estimating settlement um, in clay layers without having to pay for an expensive consolidation test. So, I, I just wanted to make note of that. Um, it uses three basic parameters um, that um, it uses three basic parameters that are ideally derived from the results of a consolidation test. You know, it's the as you're applying loads to a soil sample and looking at um, the consolidation levels and you plot that up. Um, the slopes of those curves provide some of these index, the, the compression and rebound indexes. Um, but there are ways of empirically deriving those indexes um, using the dry density the void ratio plasticity index and that over consolidation ratio and you can come pretty close to making some decisions of whether settlement is going to be an issue at a particular site uh, without the expense of a consolidation test and i have those equations and an example of how to do that um, but i just kind of feel like it's a little bit too much for this power it's not it the computations are only about a page and a half it's not that intense really um, it's very doable and, and I would go so far as to say it's practical using, like I said, just using some basic engineering properties. So that's available. If you send me an email, I can send, send those um, calculations out to you. Or um, you can apply sheer muscle to deciding whether settlement is an issue with a consolidation test. And they're running about five to six hundred dollars each so talking about the compression index and the rebound uh, index you can see that those are derived from uh, the, the plots of these compression tests so anyways i think before i get into um exhibit a which is a large part kind of narrative material. I think we'll just kind of take a break for a minute, uh, just take a five minute break. Um, and uh, Mike and I'll kind of look through some of the questions in the chat box and see if we can kind of address those together. And then we'll go into the last half of the presentation. So, so a couple of questions did come in. I want to try to answer those first. Um, it said on the bearing capacity slide, I indicated a bearing capacity, the equation had a 6.14 in there instead of a, you know, a 5.14 or 5.87. So that coefficient that's actually um, represents the bearing capacity factor and um, which is kind of a function of the angle of friction of the soil. Um, I'm not quite sure. I, th I think you could use 5.14. Um, I'm not sure where I got the 6.14 if it was, if, if I find a discrepancy in some of the references, but at the end of the day, we're applying a pretty strong safety factor. So 
I don't think that's um, and a you know a, a significant change. Um, but yeah, I think 5.14 um, would probably be just fine to use that, and maybe it is more appropriate. Um, so I guess the other thing I wanted to mention um, that Mike brought to my attention, and I'm just going to tread back here just a little bit. Um, the cons oh, let me see i got to find it here um yeah this slide here where you have basically your you ran you know the field tools the shear, the tor vein or the pocket penetrometer or there's some um inconsistencies that you're concerned about and so you you actually want to get a drill rig out there and um, pull some samples and take a kind of a closer look. There are ways of estimating or calculating bearing capacity and settlement. We, we talked about those um, using just some basic engineering properties. But if you want to, and this level of investigation is around $1,500 per hole. But if you want a geotechnical report where you want a PE stamped interpretation um, of those soil logs and on the foundation, that's where things get a little more expensive. And you can add three to five thousand dollars if you don't feel comfortable making those interpretations on your own. Um, and I think. not only are the geotechnical reports kind of expensive in general you're asking them to come to some conclusions based on looking at two or three soil borings um, and so the results are going to be fairly conservative in nature also so you're going to be paying for a report and generally it's going to be pretty conservative um, on a couple of the tanks in Minnesota, I had the reports prepared um, for about this, um, you know, where the foundation of, of for the uh, a slurry store tank had to be over excavated, you know, six feet back, filled with sand and gravel, and I'm just in that, and we were on pre-consolidated material, so kind of quickly came to the conclusion that I'd probably be better off making my own interpretations and doing my own uh, estimations for bearing capacity and settlement. Um, but that's just kind of an opinion. Um, there are good reasons to use a geotech firm beyond just logging and sampling and testing the soil where you do need that interpretation report. And I think that's particularly helpful if you're putting for example, mounting this tank on a hill slope and half of it is on a substantial amount of earth fill, for example. So I just kind of wanted to bring that up that um, there's a difference between sampling and testing and sampling and testing and getting the geotech report. So the second half, um, the presentation, I just want to talk a little bit about exhibit A. Um, this exhibit provides, the, as mentioned before, provides guidelines for NRCS investigations and establishes the basic expectations for a functional review. Um, it is a Wisconsin supplement um, and it does reference um, our national guidelines for investigations international engineering manual which is a policy manual and also NEH national engineering handbook part 631 which is a reference so exhibit a this is kind of the just quick rundown of the table of contents um, I'm not going to go through all of you know, one through 13, as far as 
the types of equipment um, that are typically used to investigate these foundations, you know, the safety, the OSHA safety protocols, uh, identifying depth of water, um, the need for bedrock profiles, um, how to handle hole closures. I, I don't want to go through all of that. Um, and probably don't either, you can read that. So we're just gonna kind of focus on the sections for investigations for above ground tanks, post and pure foundations and retaining walls. So I guess kind of the first hurdle in preparing this document is what, we're, we're not concerned about uh, earth lined ponds or concrete lined ponds or tanks um, of various sizes and types that are put in, you know, they're actually almost fully ex. They're basically the load provided by the tank is just displacing some of the original. Uh, it's just displacing uh, a soil load that that site has already experienced. So it, it kind of be who it, it kind of came down to us trying to decide what constitutes an above ground tank. Um, um, that is a point of concern uh, by myself and the staff around me. So we've kind of come, we've kind of established the bar as being a tank height that's above the original ground surface, you know. 50% or more of the tank height is above the original ground surface, and the volume of the tank is greater than 50,000 gallons, or the footprint exceeds 800 square feet. So estimating the bearing capacity and potential for total and differential settlement, um, we've divided the investigation into four cases um, with kind of an escalating need to intensify the investigation. So case one is where most of us feel comfortable, of course. Um, that's a tank uh, that's set entirely on an excavated surface of glacial till or over consolidated clay or dense coarse grain materials. Um, we don't anticipate much settlement out of those. Um, the soils have been already experienced uh, pressures equal to or greater than the loads that are being applied by the tank. So case two, um, the tank is set entirely on an excavated surface of alluvium, colluvium, or LUS. Um, in these cases, we are switching from I can actually pull uh, um, an undisturbed sample so that we're working kind of with some we're working with engineering properties um, thirdly our case three is all or a portion of the tank is set on less than three feet of earth fill above the stripping elevation and then case four is all or a portion of the tank is set on three feet or more of earth fill above the stripping elevation. So um, these decision points, um, not necessarily highly scientific, but um, there are thresholds that we've kind of derived by committee um, um, as a, you know for the investment of federal funds. So. So let's kind of take a quick look at case one. Um, some of the points of the investigation are to, you know, verify the presence of glacial till or over consolidated till. Um, the over consolidated clays can be estimated using undrained shear strength and plasticity index. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, a geologist or a soil scientist that's familiar um, with the site geology, um, they have some field tests too that they can run to confirm that you're in a uh, 
pre-consolidated or glacial till map unit. We want at least two test holes to a depth of 15 feet below the tank footings or refusal. I think that still keeps you within the scope of a backhoe pit. Uh, we want you to measure and record the relative shear strength of the soil layers in the test hole. And you can either do that in the trench wall or remove, do, um, do those field tests on soil chunks removed from the test hole using a Torvane pocket penetrometer thumb penetration test. Basically, you're logging the soils and we're looking for proof of consistency. Uh, next, if one or more of the following criteria apply to the strength of the soil layers, then no further lab testing is necessary. If these next two criterion are inconclusive, then we should be pulling an undisturbed sample that can be obtained, um, obtain an undisturbed sample for an unconfined compression test, which is not a very expensive test but it can be challenging getting an undisturbed sample, no doubt. So the first one of those criterion is if the field tests indicate the native soils have adequate bearing. Adequate bearing capacity for structures is typically around 2000 PSF, and that correlates to a tor vein of about 0.5 tons per square foot or a pocket penetrometer of one ton per square foot. And there's a lot of judgment um, involved in where to run those pocket tools, um, how often it should be run. Um, but I, I can't get to that level of detail. Um, some of this is just acquired experience. And if you don't have the experience, I recommend getting the undisturbed samples, testing, and trying to develop that um, correlation so you can you get a kind of a feel for what you're looking at and how involved you need to get. The second criterion, um, you can just use the soil description, the US Unified Soil Classification System description, and some of those consistencies, they correlate to a presumptive allowable bearing that exceeds the tank load. And you can, you can basically use the presumptive allowable bearing capacity values. So anyways, this is case one is um, a pretty liberal cut. Um, we're not too concerned. Probably the biggest part of case one is identifying whether you're in a glacial till unit or not. There we go. Case two, um, the tank is set entirely on excavated surface of a on an excavated surface of allu alluvium, colluvium, or, or lus. And we want you to drill at least three test holes below the tank footing. Um, you are into drilling, so it's pretty common uh, to drill down to 30 feet um, or refusal. And refusal can be kind of a judgment call sometimes if you get into some really stiff material. Um, there are times when maybe you could pull short at 20 feet. While you're drilling, um, we want you to con concurrently per perform uh, standard penetration testing or blow counts, drill sampling at two and a half foot intervals to depth of 15 feet, and five foot intervals after that. That's pretty standard. The soil log should indicate your blow counts, your sampling in interval, and your recovery lengths. And I showed uh, an example of that. This is okay. Um, and then lastly. Uh, we want to obtain an undisturbed sample of representative soil strata in each hole. And that one sample should be correlated to the other 
layers in the soil profile using those pocket penetrometer or shear vein. It's kind of a relative thing. So you're pulling a thin wall sample from maybe the weakest soil layer, and then you're kind of correlating that to the, the remaining portion of the soil profile using your consistency determinations. Um, seal those samples to preserve the moisture content and ship them to a lab. Um, we're just, once again, this is a tank that's completely set on an excavated surface, right? And so um, the material has not been pre-consolidated, so we still have a fairly high level of concern but we're only going to be testing for those engineering properties, specific gravity, in-place moisture content, in-place dry density, um, and an unconfined compression test. So we, you know, you can still do uh, your own estimation for bearing capacity and settlement if you feel comfortable in that. Um, doing those computations. But I think the bottom line is we want something more substantial than the fact that um, we want you to be able to act on the investigation to estimate bearing and settlement, as opposed to saying the foundation looked fine to me, or we drove over it and it looked, I think it'll be fine. Um, that's not substantiating your findings. You're basically guessing. So we just feel that it's inappropriate if you're gonna site a tank on those types of soils that you shouldn't be guessing, you should be substantiating your findings. Uh, case three um, is all or a portion of the tank is, is set on some fill. It's three feet or less, so um, we don't feel, you know, the earth fill is adding to the surcharge of the tank or the, the loading of the tank, of course. Um, but we're not putting on so much additional soil that we're concerned about some of the is other issues we talked about. So follow the protocol for case one or case two on the in-place soils as applicable. And then we want you to pay particular attention to the quality of the earth fill, the engineered earth fill that you're bringing back in under that tank. And that material should be brought in under a, a method spec, I'm sorry, under a performance spec and not a method spec. So we want to make sure um, the three feet is brought in and we've, we've compacted a lot of air out of that soil. Um, and got a little closer to the zero air points curve. So um, our expectation is that you have a performance test on that fill. The last case is where there's all or a portion of the tank is set on three feet or more of earth fill above the stripping elevation. And that is kind of our highest level of intensity of investigation. It would be nice if you could avoid uh, siting a tank um, that creates this type of condition. Um, but the variability of the sites and the sizes of the tank, there's just so many factors that kind of come into play that we've kind of deferred to a case by case basis. And it would be nice to um, be able to consult. Uh, with you on those cases before you get too far into the work. This case typically involves uh, bearing capacity and settlement computations based on consolidation and shear testing on undisturbed samples and doing the consolidation and shear tests on the remolded samples on the, from the borrow area. And in some cases, well, I'd say most of the cases, um, we're probably going to request a geology report to come with that. So, you know, you're looking at fifteen to twenty thousand dollars 
and geotechnical investigation costs for case four. So as I mentioned before, if you can avoid those, situ those situations, that would be good. So the consultation part of it is just um, agreeing. And I think most of the time you would want to bring the geotechnical firm into that consultation, agreeing to the, the number of test holes, the depth of those test holes, the types of lab tests, or lab workup that would be done. Here's kind of a cross section of concern, you know, where a tank is set on a substantial amount of earth fill on the left side. You can see the blue line uh, representing um, uh, the surface of the engineered fill brought in underneath the tank. And you can see here there's, you know, 15 to uh, 15 to 20 feet of soil is brought in under a portion of this tank and the other half of it is in excavation. So a lot of, not only are you taking the, the load of the tank and putting it on the existing soil, but you're putting a fairly substantial soil weight on top of that soil in addition to the tank load. So if the soil is 18 feet deep and it's 100 pounds per cubic foot, that's 1800 PSF just with the soil load and you're adding that onto the 2000 pounds per square foot applied by the tank wall on the footing. Um, you're getting some pretty high pressure. So we are more concerned in this case about bearing capacity, shear, shear failures. And we are certainly more concerned about settlement. Um, I think it's a pretty common um, prescription. Soils are pretty complicated, and you're drilling, you know, two, three, four holes, um, running lab tests on just one particular layer in that soil or two. There's an awful lot of unknown between what's being sampled and tested. And the calculations or estimates of settlement, um, you know, it's going to have a range associated with an uncertainty range. And at the end of the day, I think what that ends up being on a case like this is where you preload the foundation and let it sit there for a while before you start building the tank. And I've seen that done on school buildings, for example, you know, where there's, you know, where they're worried about glass breaking. I mean, the settlement is, is not permissible. Um, and you see a lot of those foundations being preloaded with a pile of dirt for three or four months. And I think that's kind of what you're moving into if you're trying to, you get into these situations here where you're perching, perch, perching a tank on a hill slope. Also, we're probably gonna ask for some slope stability modeling because you kind of get into a situation where you're surcharging a slope and there could be a deep seated rotational failure underneath that tank. So, this case four situation involves a lot of things. Settlement, bearing capacity or shear failure, and slope stability. Okay, so the next part I wanted to talk about the investigation for post and peer foundations. A little more uh, relaxed approach, but nevertheless, a concern of mine. Um, for a large, substantially we're following the recommendations for foundation investigations from the American Society of Agricultural Engineers, um, EP 486.3, shallow post and peer foundation design. Um, once again, uh, I know a lot of the 
manufactured buildings like Morton, Lester, Cleary, Maribel, you know, they'll put their reactions, they'll specify their reactions on those posts or piers, and it's the responsibility of the siting engineer uh, to verify that the soil can support those loads or those moments. So, um, or shears and moments on those posts, I should say. So typically, and I'll use the word typically, um, these investigations include five holes, one in each corner of the building and one in the center. Um, the depth of the exploration should exceed the footing depth by a couple of feet. Mike was mentioning to me, he tends to want to go five or 10 feet below the footing. Um, but the prescriptive depth for investigation is largely driven by how far the, you know, with, you know, the, with the vertical pressure distribution would be under that footing. And we showed a slide showing where you would investigate to. So, um, if you don't know what the footing depth is when you're out there doing the soils investigation because you don't have the building design yet or whatever, um, you know, we'd want to be a couple of feet below the frost depth in the local codes. If the unified soil classification is a dense coarse grain soil, the bottom of the test hole, you know, we're not concerned. least to the point where you need lab samples. We still want you to measure and record the relative shear strength of the soil layers in the test hole. Some of these post frame buildings, the posts aren't just putting a vertical load on the soil. They're actually, there's moments and shears associated with the reaction of those posts. So the foundation, the trench wall has to resist some lateral movement. And so that's why we're asking for um, some idea of relative shear strength of the soil layers in the hole, because the sidewall has to support some lateral loading. <clears throat> um, if one of the criteria of the following criteria apply to the strength of the soil layers, lab samples aren't required. And that's, those are the same criterion that you've seen for the under above ground tanks earlier. As a substitution for test holes, there has been some investigations uh, conducted um, some of these geotech firms have a cone penetrometer a dynamic cone penetrometer that they can bring out and measure and record the relative shear strength of the soil profile every 12 inches using that equipment so i wanted you to be aware that that's out there and it is often used i want to mention a little bit some of these buildings are just they're 400 feet long i mean you it's really hard to find a good level site. And so um, eventually you get into a situation where you gotta bring earth fill under a portion of that building. So we have made some, provided some guidelines uh, for how to investigate these sites with, with earth fill that's used to level up those foundations. Um, like I said, our, my, our concern with earth fill is the earth fill has to be put in in such a way that it can provide that lateral side wall strength in those pre-excavated holes to support the reactions of those posts. And they do experience some shear and bending moments depending on the design and you need to be aware of that. Um, as a siting engineers, you need to be aware of that. And I'm not sure how much communication and how much of the building design is getting exchanged between the siting engineer and the building manufacturers, so, or the engineer of record on the building. 
So if the earth fill above the stripping elevation is less than four feet under all or a portion of the building footprint, um, then we basically just want you to take um, run some compaction tests on a composite sample of borrowed material and make sure that that material is brought in under a performance spec. We're assuming, the reason we used four feet is because we were assuming that at least the bottom of the post is gonna be sitting on native material. If the, if the earth fill is more than four feet, now you got the, the post, it's also bearing on that remolded fill. Um, and so now we've got a concern, not only with the lateral support in the, those pre-excavated holes for the posts or piers, now we're kind of concerned the fact that the posts are setting on fill, fill themselves. And so this is kind of a case where we really, we just, I need to talk to you about it. We need some kind of a case by case consultation. If you're bringing in more than four feet of fill to level up a building. Uh, lastly, the investigation for retaining walls or knee walls. Uh, I'm not sure if I spelled knee wall right. Um, but these retaining walls or foundation walls provide vertical. Um, you know, the minimum site investigation typically is five test holes, one at each corner and one in the center of the structure. Um, you know, we are concerned about um, the same issues, bearing and settlement and how that could influence or drive uh, cracking or failure of the footings. And so the depth of exploration should be one and a half times the anticipated base width of the footing. Um, we're not like as, as as in with post and piers, we're not overly concerned if you're in, you know, dense coarse grain soils. Um, once again, um, we want you to measure and record the relative shear strength of soil layers in the test hole. That's just part of normal logging. Consistency is a normal part of logging. The problem that we've had is sometimes consistency just using the thumb penetration isn't very helpful. Kind of depends on the person doing it. Um, and so, you know, and you're putting in descriptors like stiff, very stiff, you know, I mean, it's really hard to kind of interpret that. And so, we are kind of pushing people to try to quantify that a little bit using a tor vein or a pocket penetrometer of some sort. And then once again, if one of the following criteria apply to the strength of the soil layers, lab samples aren't required. And that's similar languages that's been noted above or similar criteria. Uh, one, you know, we do see some value uh, that could be used out there. Um, the same concerns with earth fill, that if you're four feet or less, you know, we, of earth fill, um, we would like you to get a composite blend of soil from the borrow material um, and get that to the lab and run a compaction test on it and use a performance spec. And if you're on more than four feet of fill, we're going to take those on a case by case basis. And I'd like 
it would be nice to have that consultation before you invest a lot into the investigation and the design. So I think that's it. Um, there's a lot more to um, exhibit A um, than what I mentioned. I just I threw a lot of narrative to at you, a lot of reading on these PowerPoints. It's not very much fun. And I'm sure you'll probably have questions as you start reading it, but I guess it's just kind of a gross overstatement that we want some attention paid to the bearing capacity and settlement of these foundations. And we don't, these are expensive structures with environmental consequences in a lot of cases. And what we've seen a lot of up to this point is a routine check for separation to bedrock and water. Um, you know, from a groundwater pr protection standpoint. Um, and we're not really getting any attention paid uh, to the competency of the foundation. And it's people just saying, well, it looks fine to me. We drove on it, we drove on it with a, a loader. We drove on it with a cat. We don't, we don't, it looks fine. Those subjective decisions need to be start we need to start substantiating those. Um, and I guess that's kind of the overarching objective of exhibit four in this PowerPoint presentation is just to pay some attention to the foundation. And um, I think I'll kind of leave it at that. Um, yeah, let me take a look quick in the chat room and um, Yeah, there are a few out there. Yeah. So I think some of these questions we've at, answered about how many soil borings should be performed. You know, there's other issues of how do you get a soil boring if there's existing concrete slabs in the way. Um, there's a lot of variance uh, and accessibility issues that need to be considered, and I just this presentation it's there's some good judgment involved and um, hopefully if you if you don't have that or don't have that experience level you can get a hold of somebody who does um, how is the geotechnical report paid for that's a good question um, you know traditionally NRCS is we for the most part we pay 75% cost share for these federally funded structures. And um, a lot of states are only paying 50% roughly. Um, and I guess the general feeling has been, and I think it continues to be that the owners are gonna have to pick up the cost of those investigations. Um, Steve, Matt Woodrow mm -hmm. had also added that the geotech services can be paid through the state funding, the swarm at CAP 50, and is lesser. Yeah, of, thank you for that. Of either 70% of the actual cost of the engineering service or 15% of the total eligible cost of the cost shared practice, exclusive of the ex engineering cost. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, Yeah, there's some, there was a good question about investigating these sites with a backhoe pit, um, you know, and underneath some of these tanks and buildings, and that's a pretty big hole. And how do you backfill those holes so that, I don't know what the right word for it would be, is that the backfill is competent enough or equal to or greater than, um, the compaction in in the existing soil it is a concern because you're opening up a pretty big pit 
under the floors of these tanks and our preference is to try to get it around the perimeter don't open up a 20 or 30 a 20 foot backhoe pit with half to one or one to one side slopes um, in the middle portions of these tanks unless you have a good plan of how to put that fill back in there so that it's at the same density as the surrounding soil so that's a really good question and a good point to bring up um You know, what if you don't fall in any of the four cases? The site is not glacial till, not alluvium, colluvium, or loss, and it's not on fill. Um, you know, we can't, I'm not sure how many other variants are out there, but you know, the default, I guess, is just give us a phone call, give me a phone call and we'll talk about it, I guess. Um, Yeah, a lot of the questions have to do with how do we pay for it, um, and that, that is a, is a concern. Uh, one of the concerns that wasn't brought up is how to collect an undisturbed sample from a backhoe pit. So we just NRCS just hired a geologist, another geologist. We were sharing one, uh, Tim Weisbrod, with Minnesota. Tim's down in Alaska, and we recently hired a new geologist. Just uh, or Wisconsin, um, Scott Borchard. So I, we're going to be kind of putting them on a mission to help us find um, some good techniques for obtaining thin walled or Shelby tube samples from uh, the trench walls of backhoe pits where it's not safe to get down in there. You know, how can we press those samples? without having to open the hole up to where it's OSHA safe to get down in there. So, but getting an undisturbed sample can be tricky with a backhoe, but there are ways of doing it. And we will try to find those ways so that we can save the owner a little bit of money and not get a drill ring out there. Um, yeah. And there was another question regarding uh, tank walls or continuous concrete walls under roofs. You know, what does one test hole every 50 feet for walls mean? Does a, a 10 by 200 building require uh, 12 test holes? You know, no, it doesn't. I, like I said, I think the general rule is we want to get a good distribution of holes around the perimeter. That's usually, you know, four. Um, but I think there was, I think how that came up was there are some continuous retaining walls that might not uh, form a bunker or, a, you know, take take some type of a, rec, a footprint shape. Um, I don't know if that would be in the case of a diversion or whatever. That was a concern that was brought up in the development of exhibit A and we just basically said one hole every 50 feet in those cases. So I guess that's about it. Um, I appreciate the time uh, today. Um, it might have been, a, I'm sure it was a little bit of a deeper dive for some folks than what they would have preferred. And for other folks, it's probably too much on the simplified side. So I apologize if it doesn't meet your expectations on those ends. Um, but I, hopefully it, I, I was able to kind of convey my concerns um, as a state conservation engineer and trying to establish kind of a standard of care for the investment of federal funds um, in these farm set structures. So um, anyways, Thanks for your time, and uh, Penny, I'll let you close it out. Okay. Well, thanks much, Steve, and I'm sure Mike O'Shea was in the background giving his input. Um, we wish Mike all the yeah. best in his retirement.
that's about it. This was recorded. It will be posted on the Wisconsin Land and Water Media website in the future. And if you have any training ideas, let me know. And again, thanks, everyone. Have a great day, and we'll see you soon. Okay, thank you.